So today, however, we are welcoming Dr. Audi Santoso, who is here with us, um, joining us this summer. He is the Vice Dean of Students and Lecturer in Systematic and Biblical Theology at the International Reformed Evangelical Seminary in Jakarta, Indonesia. He is the recipient of this year's Meter Center Faculty Fellowship, and we are delighted to have him here. He obtained his PhD in 2021, so very recently, but congratulations, <laughs> yes, at the Theological University of Apeldoorn. Uh, Van den Hoek and Ruprecht have published the book version of his thesis, and this book is titled um, Union with God, an Assessment of Deification, Theosis, in the Theologies of Robert Jensen and John Calvin. And his presentation to us today is based on his research that he has been conducting here at the Meter Center for the past number of weeks, and it is titled In the Spirit, an Addendum to the Triune formulation and its implications based oh sorry then miss that an addendum to the triune i can't even read my own writing which is a problem <laughs> you have it here in the spirit an addendum to the triune formulation and its implications based on john calvin's concept of the auto theos trinity so please join me in first of all in welcoming dr santoso Right, I'm going to share my screen so that the people who are watching online can watch it as well. Share. Yeah, thank you, Karin, for the setup and also for the introduction. And yeah, good evening, uh, afternoon, everyone. Yeah, um, thank you for attending uh, my presentation. I'm grateful for the opportunity given you know, to do research here in the Meter Center and also happy 40th anniversary. And I wish more years some mm -hmm. blessings flowing from this center. Yeah, a bit of my background. I'm a Chinese Indonesian, just like Dr. Yuda Tianto. Uh, I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. So the greater Jakarta has a population of roughly like 29 million people, three times of the size of the Michigan state's population. Yeah, and this is our church and seminary complex in Jakarta, Indonesian Reformed Evangelical Church. Uh, the seminary is International Reformed Evangelical Seminary, founded by Reverend Dr. Stephen Tong. He's the architect of this building complex which consists of the church, you know, the large blue dome there. The middle sections are seminary. And also there's a world famous uh, concert hall, Aula Symphonia Jakarta. And on the tower side, we have like the museum, Calvin Christian School and Calvin Institute Technology. And the upper level are some apartments where pastors like myself located there. Mm -hmm. And on the 22nd floor, mm -hmm. and at the very top, mm -hmm. there's a helipad. So if you are ever thinking of coming to Jakarta, <laughs> I welcome you there. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, my presentation in the spirit. That's the short title. Right, so what is the issue? There is an idiom, the elephant in the room. It refers to the problem that everyone knows about, and yet no one or so few discuss it. And what is the subject? The spirit. So... The issue is that there is insufficiency in the current triune formulation passed down from the Nicene Creed, both in the East and the West variant that includes the Filioque. And as you can see, uh, these are the formulations from the Nicene Creed, the original in 325, and the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in 381. So you can see that there are some slight changes in the generation of the sun, but the great addition is at the locus of the spirit. The addition by the Western Church is in the bracket, and the Sun uh, was affirmed at the Council of Toledo in 589 AD. Yeah, let me read just the Nicene Creed in the 381 version. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father, then the addition before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, that, that, that. And then the second on the locus uh, for the spirit and in the Holy Spirit, and that's the great addition, the Lord and life giver who proceeds from the Father, that's the original version, and added by uh, in the Western, and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is together worship and together glorified, who spoke through the prophets. So what does the creed affirm? The creed affirms that the Son is begotten from the Father only. This is uh, will be made obvious in the Athanasian Creed, only from the Father. And the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in the Western uh, formulation. 
Now the question that I'd like to raise and discuss at this small uh, time opportunity is what is the role of the spirit in the generation of the sun, right? And we will approach it uh, from Calvin's theology. And this is a bit about historical context of John Calvin and how it is important that um, the doctrine of Trinity is definitely important for him. It is incorporated in his writing since, uh, you know, from 1536 till 1561. He has disputes with people, various people like you know, Pierre Caroli, uh, Michael Servetus, and also later Giorgio Biandrata. So again, uh, it has been incorporated in his writing from the very beginning till the very last. Then also we can see that Calvin uh, critically received the creeds. Now at the time of the Reformation, the Ad Fontas leads to the Sola Scriptura principle. And radicals like you know, Michael Servetus ends up in becoming anti-Trinitarian. Calvin also affirms the uh, Sola Scriptura principle, but he did not reject you know, the tradition of the creeds. He critical, critical towards the creeds. So when he was forced by Caroli to subscribe to the ancient creeds, well, Calvin argues that he could articulate the Trinity in biblical terms. So Calvin basically agrees with the creed, but with the content, but not necessarily with the expressions. And again, in Reformed theology, we can see that the creeds are the norma normata, norming norms, uh, whereas only the scripture is the norma normans non normata, the norming norm that itself is not norm. So it is absolute that the, the scripture uh, position is primary. So creeds are always secondary in Reformed theology, and it has to comply with the scripture. Yeah, it's the norma normans non normata. And again, when we see Calvin's uh, articulation, he follows the Western variant of the creeds. Okay, now let's go into deeper the Calvin's Autotheos Trinity regarding the Son and also the Spirit. And I think the no notion of the Father as Autotheos, as God in himself, is yeah, taken for granted, it is uh, true. But what about autotheos of the Son? In general, this is what Calvin says. For in each hypostasis, the whole divine nature, or osia, is understood. The hypostasis is the person, defined by Calvin as subsistence, subsistence in God's essence. So in other words, whether it is the Father or the Son or the Spirit whom we refer to, that particular person is fully God. Each has the full osia, not one third, not half, but the whole of it. And so it is for the autotheos of the sun. And so of the sun, we can say that the sun has no beginning or his own beginning, soul beginning, in his own being as God in his osia. And yet at the same time, the sun's person, his hypostasis, has his beginning from the father. And so Calvin was only following Augustine on this matter, on autotheos in which he quotes that Christ with respect to himself is called God, with respect to the Father is, is Son. And Calvin and then carry on uh, regarding the deity of the Son, in which he does not just take the passage from Hebrew 1, verse 1 to 3, which uh, can articulate the Nicene understanding of um, the Son's deity, you know, generated from the Father. In which this, uh, the passage says the sun as the exact imprint of God's nature. But Calvin also um, articulate from passage John verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 3 and verse 18, that the word, the Logos, is at the Father's bosom. He abides everlastingly, perpetually resided with God. So the idea is uh, in the opposite direction, if you can uh, see that. So Calvin argues from both, and that is uh, in his. Uh, section uh, book one chapter 13 first uh, uh, section seven and eight the deity and the eternity of the word so this is how calvin shows from the john's gospel passage a non-nicing way of articulation to express the deity of the son on a side note of course uh, this passage is uh, problematic because of oregon's interpretation in which he uh, differentiates between the father as hoteos or toteos with the son as only the teos so maybe that's the part of the reason why it fall into this favor of use in the Nicene formulation. All right. Then about the autotheos of the spirit. We can read here in the last paragraph from Institutes uh, 11320. 
Even so, Christ himself calls God in his entirety spirit. Referring to John 4, 24. For nothing excludes the view that the whole essence of God is spiritual, in which are comprehended Father, Son, and Spirit. For as we dare hear God called Spirit, so also do we hear the Holy Spirit, seeing that the Spirit is a hypostasis of the whole essence, spoken of as of God and from God. Now the, part, the last part, of God and from God, this shows the differentiation again between the Oceania and the hypothesis of the Spirit. Of God shows that the Holy Spirit is used in a generic terms. It refers to the Oceania of God, which is the whole essence of God, in which are comprehended the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And when it's used to refer from God, it refers to the hypothesis of the third person of the Trinity as one who proceeds from the Father and the Son. So this is how Calvin articulates the autotheos of the spirit. Now, as we carry on, um, Calvin is you know, not common to theologize uh, speculatively. Mm -hmm. And I think Calvin's speculation in his theology is kept at a bare minimum. But even so, I think he did mention about uh, God's post here. And this in this passage, 1, 13, 16, in which he says, we conclude then that word and spirit are nothing else than the very essence of God. Somehow, if you read secondary materials, you cannot find uh, people saying that word and spirit are essence of God. But here it is in 1, 13, 16. So what can we learn from this? He says, uh, Calvin believes that the essence of God is simple. It is a simple unity. It is an in, or in, in other words, he also says it's an integral, integral perfection, integral perfection between word and spirit. And this is again based on John chapter 1 and John chapter 4, verse 24. So what God is, God in his essence, is who God is, the word and spirit. And so in this manner, God's essence is personal. That in each person, again, the formulation of autotheos, that in each person, the whole essence is understood. Now, this is the autotheos uh, trinity. And I think we have to understand Calvin's view of eternity in order to find what is the role of the spirit. Now, Calvin's view of eternity is uh, captured here in 1, 13, 18. Indeed, although the eternity of the father is also the eternity of the son and the spirit, since God could never exist apart from his wisdom and power, and we must not seek in eternity a before or an after. Nevertheless, the observance of an order is not meaningless or superfluous. When the Father is thought of as first, then from him the Son, and finally from both the Spirit. Well, the later part we will uh, discuss later on. Um, but here we find, again, Calvin's view of eternity, that there is not before nor after. And we have to broaden this uh, anti-Aryan statement regarding the, the eternity of the word uh, of the Son. There was no time when the sun was not, and we have to broaden it to capture also the spirit, that there was no time when the spirit was not. So definitely, in the generation of the sun, the spirit was there. And what role that he has? Now, in understanding about the generation of the sun, it is common to be uh, you know, understood as a communication of essence. But again, how do we interpret it in an autotheam manner? I think the answer again is yes and no. No, in the sense that the Son has the whole essence as autotheos, as God, the Son is not generated, he is his soul beginning. And yes, in the sense that the person of the Son is generated by the Father, and the essence is the Spirit. So the generation of the Son is done in the Spirit. So that is how we reformulate God's opera at intra, that the Father generates the Son in the Spirit. Spirit to quit. And the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. So this is what is lacking in the Nicene Creed that, and the following creeds thereafter. This is a phrase of this manner of saying, we can say that uh, opera trinitatis at extra uh, sun in divisa, but also at intra sun in divisa. That the, not only the external work of the Trinity is inseparable 
uh, but also the work of the Trinity in himself in the opera at Intra. Now the brief formula is quite common, you know, from the Father through the Son and in the Holy Spirit. And Calvin formulates it uh, in his own way, in which he says that to the Father is attributed the beginning of activity and the fountain and wellspring of all things. To the Son, wisdom, counsel, and the ordered disposition of all things. But to the Spirit is assigned the power and efficacy of that activity. So again, it affirms that the opera Trinitatis Sum in Divisa, including in the generation and the spiration. Now, how do, you, how do we understand God's opera intra? Well, one person who has uh, think about it, Thomas Weilandi, he, think he, he thinks uh, the, the generation and the spiration is one simultaneous act of divine discourse. Uh, he says that the father spirates the spirit in the same act by which he begets the son. For the spirit proceeds from the father as the fatherly love in whom or by whom the son is begotten. Now, I think we can yeah, explore this a little bit um, to understand it in a Trinitarian manner uh, as a divine discourse. Robert Jensen says that what is the reality of God? And he says it's a divine discourse. So how do we understand it? The father is speaking the son as the word. And the word, due to his consubstantiality to the father, is capable to speak similarly like the father to the father. And the spirit as the one who listens, as a reference in John chapter 16, the spirit is the one who listens, empowers both the father and the son to speak and listen. This conversation is eternal without beginning nor ends. Now I should pause for a while and mention that the following statements are one among the rare occurrences of wonderful insights in academic writing. And I experienced this warm of heart when writing out uh, the coming statements. I was thinking, what is the content of God's eternal conversation? So it is. There's a unique role of the spirit, that the spirit is the one who searches the depths of God in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10. It's active to bring the word who is in the bosom of the Father, John 1, 18, or within the Son himself to be spoken out. That speaking is loving. And theologically, the word that the Father speaks eternally is my beloved Son. And the Son's reply is, Abba. Now we come to the benefits and implications of this reformulation. So what are the benefits? The, what uh, we have, the benefits from filiope, the spiration filiope, is mirrored uh, with the benefits that we get from the generation spiritual quake. First, in the filiope, we have the consubstantiality of the son to the father, because the son can do what the father do. The spirit proceeds from the father and also from the son. So the son is consubstantial, to the Father. Then, in the Spirit way, we can see the consubstantiality of the Spirit to the Father. The Son is generated from the Father in the Spirit. <clears throat> so there's consubstantiality there. And by implication, we remove the ontological subordination of the Son in the generation because He is yeah, equal to the Father. And so it is, we remove the subordination of the spirit in the procession. And we benefit uh, that we have a clearer that there is a reciprocal relationship between the son and the spirit. It's not just unidirectional, the filioque, that the spirit proceeds from the son, but also that yeah, the son is generated in the spirit. But is there a hypostatic submission of the spirit or and also of the son? Question mark. Now, instead of seeing this as a problem, I see this as a benefit in the way we uh, interpret the formulation in auto ten manner that we can see um, interpreted uh, auto -teo, uh, in, term, in terms of auto trinity. We can see the hypostatic submission corresponds 
to the work of God of extra in the incarnation and in the outpouring of the spirit. Now, maybe you are aware that there is a subordination discussion about uh, the eternal subordination of the sun or the eternal function and functional subordination. Yeah, I think by uh, Wayne Gruden, uh, then William Golliger, or Truman, also yeah, Bruce Ware, the Wayne Gruden side. Uh, so what is the final say about this? I think there's some continuing discussion about it. And in 2018, Gerald Gray wrote an article, The Eternal Subordination of the Son of God, question mark. Um, he endorsed the idea of the eternal subordination, Gray. But he says that, you know, the term subordination certainly has the Aryan connotation, that as though Jesus is a lesser God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he proposed a better terminology, a loving submission of the Son. One that I adopt here, as you can see, a hypostatic submission that applies not only to the Son, but also to the Spirit. So in the Atotean manner, um, we can say that the, the Son is equal to the Father in his ocean. But in his, his hypostatic submission, uh, sorry, in his hypothesis uh, lies his hypostatic submission. And so this translates later on to the two sons, to the sons, two natures upon his incarnation. So the incarnation of the son is reflected, you know, uh, what happened in God's opera, Atintra, in eternity, uh, can be seen in the incarnation of the son, which is from the father and in the spirit. And again, when we see the outpouring of the spirit at Pentecost, um, we understand it's from the Father and the Son. But there is also more to it since the incarnation had happened. It is not a unidirectional relationship. The sending of the Spirit is qualified by the incarnation. Calvin says that uh, in his commentary on Acts, Jesus is the anointed of the Lord, the governor of the church, and the giver of the Holy Ghost. The anointed of the Lord that is proper to his human nature. So there's a reciprocal relationship there. The spirit anoint is the not the oil, but the spirit that is used to anoint Jesus. And he is the giver of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus Christ is the receiver and giver of the spirit. This is the terms used by Richard Gavin in his book, In the Fullness of Time. So simultaneously anointed by the spirit, proper in his human nature, and he's the one who conducts baptism of the spirit proper in his divine nature. And the spirit itself has a new role as the spirit of the son. Because the son is already God-man. Not only as the spiritus creator, filioque as, uh, as well, from the son in his role as creator. But the spirit is also spiritus uh, redeemer, qualified as yeah, the one who dwells in the body of Christ, the church. So this shows how this shows what are being carried out by God in history. The opera extra reflects what is true in God Himself in eternity. That's opera atintra, and so we can say like the um, the immanent Trinity is the economic Trinity. Now, last but last but not least. Um, we will discuss about the taxis here. The monarchy of the father in the taxis is affirmed in ad intra and also in ad extra that the father holds the primary. Um, but I'm afraid that the taxis, you know, is lost. This may be the loss um, uh, from the benefits that we have. Uh, it is not. It's no longer the father, the son, and the spirit. It can be like the Father and then the Spirit and the Son. Because with our incorporation of the in the Spirit, the taxes are, you know, it has a reciprocal relationship between the Son and the Spirit, both in at intra and at extra. But we know that the, the at intra, the Father holds the primacy because the generation is from the Father and the aspiration again from the Father. And in the at, at extra, we can see that the father acts as the one who sent the son and later who sent the spirit. And the father is the unsent sender, is the one who sent the son. And the son being sent 
he accomplished his mission, returns to the father, and he sends the spirit together with the father. So the son is the son sender, and later the spirit as well. He's a son sender. Understand from the point of incarnation, in fact, but also later in the church history in the book of Acts, where he appoints uh, set apart people like Barnabas and Saul, and then send them uh, to preach the gospel. So we can see the primacy of the father there. And we can say that, as Calvin also affirms, that the father is the sons and the spirits, once divinitatis. Now, despite the loss, uh, we do know that the order in baptism is firm based on what Jesus had commanded. Baptize them in the name of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. And so we simply keep the taxes by obeying what uh, Jesus has commanded in that great commandment. Okay, so this is the, the end of my presentation. All right, thank you. So thank you so much, Audi. Um, can you speak a little bit about how this uh, project maybe connects to the research you did for your PhD? Like, are you expanding from your PhD or maybe developing something out of that? Can you say anything about that? Yeah. Um... Okay, so from my dissertation, I um, you know discuss about what is the Trinitarian understanding of Calvin. Try to explore whether uh, perichoresis has a play a part in Calvin's Trinitarian theology, and it appears not. John McLean is the one who says that you cannot find the word perichoresis or circumcessio mm -hmm. in Calvin's uh, yeah writings. So there was excluded, and then I tried to explore from Benjamin Warfield, which he says that uh, autotheos is the contribution of Calvin in the uh, Trinitarian discussion. Um, so I, I started from there and then tried to think again, yeah, what is the role of the spirit? Um, because again, I think the problem in the, the, that is uh, being addressed in systematic theology is, yeah, again, the, the issue of pneumatology. Mm -hmm. and it was Robert Jensen, I think, who points out that there's a pneumatological deficit, both in the West and the East mm -hmm. uh, formulation traditions. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I tried to explore what can, what can Calvin uh, say from his uh, yeah, theology about this. Thank you, yeah. that's very helpful. Other questions or things people want to ask or find out more about? Yeah. In early reform covenant theology, some of this, I think, hypostatic mm. submission language is used in covenantal terms, um, where you have a, a submission of the son to the will of the father to carry out this redemptive project that they're planning. I don't recall that they talk much about the role of the Holy Spirit, but do you think that this framework that you're developing here? Um, can be adequately described in covenantal, properly described in covenantal language? And could you see then a uh, role for the spirit in covenantal terms as well? Or aren't you so covered? I'm talking, of course, about the pactum salutis, the mm -hmm. uh, covenant redemption. Um, or aren't you so com comfortable with that, with that covenantal concept? Yeah. Okay. And you want to say first? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So the question was, um, how does Calvin's thinking, or how does how does this uh, this reflection that Audi is working on, how does that connect with maybe the uh, reformed reflection on covenantal theology and how that might be connected? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your question, Lyle. Um, I do try to understand this, uh, you know, in terms of factum salutis, and well, let me read from what Duffing defines uh, about factum salutis. He says that here the basis of all covenants was found in the eternal counsel of God in a covenant between the very persons of the Trinity, the Pactum Salutis, or Council of Peace. The work of salvation is an undertaking of the one God in three persons in which all cooperate and each one performs a, specific, a special task. It is the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit who together conceive determine, carry out, and complete the entire work of salvation. The benefit to the believer is in knowing that the covenant of grace executed and revealed in time and history 
nevertheless rests on an eternal unchanging foundation, the counsel of the triune God. The Father is the eternal Father, the Son, the eternal mediator, and the Holy Spirit, the eternal paraclete. Um, so I think Buffing tries to, again, uh, see the God's opera as the ontological uh, you know, um, ground for God's works in opera of extra. And again, he understands uh, uh, the opera Trinitatis is, is, soon, is soon in divisa, that each has its own role, its own task in the one work of God. Now, again, the problem with, uh, with uh, I'll say, my concern with the Pactum Salutis is we understand the will of God is only one because Jesus is the only one who has two wills because he has two natures. So God, God's will is not uh, coupled with his hypostasis, uh, but with his divine nature. So there's only one will of God. So we have to understand this again, I think in the, in the Atotheon manner, that there's only one will of God, will together by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And it is seen in the relation uh, of God himself, which is more natural. Uh, again, you can understand the Pactum Salutis as the divine discourse uh, that God decides to, uh, to speak about it. And so it is coming from both the triune persons in, in one essence. Yeah. But you have some discomfort then with this whole concept of a if, eternal covenant of redemption. I mean, if we understand that, uh, you know, the father has his own will and the son has his own will, then, then it is problematic. Yeah. But not if we understand it as, yeah, from God himself, the trying persons. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions or insights? Yeah, Tim, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Audi, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> well, I have two, two questions. On the one hand, um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more. You mentioned at the at the end of your talk, I think, um, but I, I think I may have missed it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some of the biblical uh, texts that you're thinking of when you're thinking of the Spirit sending the Son, because of course, whenever we're, whenever we talk about the the uh, procession of the of the spirit and, and the generation of the son. Typically, those have been indexed pretty closely to biblical passages, right? Where the names of the son and spirit are are attached to these this language of divine sending. Um, so I was wondering if you could if you could speak to which biblical passages you're thinking of um, with respect to the spirit's sending of the son. Um, and then the other thing I was wondering about was at the end, you you kind of link these, the question of the economic uh, and the imminent trinity. Um, and you do so by talking about the God's works ad extra and his works ad intra. Um, and I was wondering if you could clarify for us that the, uh, some of the older traditions would have used the language of missions and processions, right, as a way of distinguishing what's um, necessary and uh, essential of, about God's being from the kind of contingent and um, and voluntary acts that God undertakes in the economy. And so I guess I was just wondering if you could if you could clarify for me what what relationship you you're wanting to see there between economic and imminent trinity. are you are you wanting to do the kind of um, like Rahner move where you strictly identify the two with one another, or would you see there being some contingency in the missions of the, the Son and the Spirit that they undertake in, in the economy? Okay. Does that make sense? I don't, there's a lot there. <laughs> let so, me let me just okay. clarify for our, for our speaker. So number one, the biblical passages on which you are making your final point. So what are, what are the biblical passages you're thinking of? And then second was the connection between the economic and the imminent understanding of the Trinity. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. For the first question, I think you can see from yeah, passages like Luke chapter, chapter one. Yeah. 
uh, I think in which uh, the angel spoke to Mary. The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. I think that's the, we can see clearly that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now Calvin actually uh, see the incarnation as the work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That the Father is the one who prepares the body for Jesus and the, the Son himself uh, who, you know, uh, make his body. And again, the Spirit here from uh, Luke chapter 1 is the one uh, who make that uh, body uh, become efficacy, the efficacy to make that body. So Calvin, uh, unfortunately, he did not write it together in one passage, yeah. in one mm -hmm. work, but separately. Mm -hmm. You can find that yeah. again, the work of God is actually inseparable. Yeah, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Okay, then regarding the immanent and economic trinity. Yeah, I think to the to a certain extent, we can say Karl Runner's uh, dictum is right. You know, the immanent trinity is the economic trinity and vice versa. Of course, we always approach uh, the, our understanding of the immanent trinity from God's works. And I think that's how Calvin also approach uh, yeah, in his uh, theology, uh, he mentions that. Um, but again, the church then reflects uh, the, the theology and so try to formulate what is the immanent trinity yeah, appears in the creeds. And I think the creeds, again, sometimes we need to, again, critically reflect on it, just like the Nicene Creed, it was revised. And so I think the addition of the, in the spirit is also legitimate in that sense. Um, yeah, so I think Michael Valker, uh, he did mention about uh, the relation. It's not as, you know, simply like the immanent trinity is the economic trinity and the vice versa, but he did mention that the immanent trinity is the ontological ground in our understanding of the economic trinity. And what happens in history, he says, added something new to the immanent trinity. It is contingent you know, because God is free. Um, and yet God is the one who decides he is free and he is the one who chooses what he wants to do. But it is entirely natural. It's not improper uh, in himself. Uh, yeah, in eternity. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ronald? Yes. Uh, thank you, Adi, for your paper. Um, I got a question. Um, could you help me just understand, do you think that Calvin adds anything to the Trinitarian theology that he inherited from the early church in the Middle Ages? Does he add anything? Does he change something? And how do you relate, I don't know, whatever you say to that, how would you relate that to what Calvin um, really says in the, the prefatory letter to King Francis, where he's basically saying, you're hearing that this is a new heretical thing, but really we're just recovering what the early church taught all along. So this isn't really new. Mm -hmm. So is it new? And how, if it is new, how does it fit with what he, he tells Francis? All right. So just a quick summary. The question is, does Calvin add anything new or change anything to what he had inherited in terms of the doctrine of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, compared to what he had already um, heard about or learned himself? Okay, great question. Um, I think it was B.B. Warfield yeah, who says that uh, the Autotheos Trinity is a great contribution of Calvin. So he says that, um, you know, it is developed greatly by three persons, uh, Tertullian, Augustine, and then Calvin. So according to Warfield, the Autotheos Trinity uh, remove any subordination that exists in the, in the triune God. Now, when you ask whether Calvin did something new, apparently uh, in my finding, it's not. So it has been all along teached by uh, church fathers. And in fact, in fact it was formulated uh, during the 11th Council of Toledo, the creed of the 11th Council of Toledo. Let me read the, the, the passage. Although we profess three persons, we do not profess three substances 
but one substance and three persons. If we are asked about the individual person, we must answer that he is God. Therefore, we may say God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But they are not three gods. He is one God. Each single person is holy God in himself, and all three persons together are one God. So again, it reflects what Calvin uh, mentioned about Autotheos Trinity. Um, the, the beginning, uh, the, the Son has beginning uh, from the Father and no beginning. It also appears in uh, Athanasius. Uh, Athanasius tries to, to formulate the uh, right uh, formulation of uh, yeah, Christ's um, divine nature. So in that sense, it is all along uh, from the church fathers. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yuda? Uh, if I may continue from what Ronald asked, uh, uh, particularly I'm uh, uh, thinking about the uh, uh, perichoresis. You mentioned that Calvin didn't use perichoresis or yeah. superficial. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, uh, autotheos uh, discussion that Calvin um, gives us, is, is this the replacement of um, uh, perichoresis, the equivalence, or is Calvin developing something new out of that? Okay. All right. So let me repeat that. So, um, if, if Calvin didn't use the term perichoresis, is what he is saying actually a replacement for it or an expansion of it for that particular term and idea? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I did um, try to think about it. And I think the first, you know, the Autotheon, uh, Autotheos Trinity, somehow should be compatible with the understanding of perichoresis. So I was again wondering how come that Calvin did not like, endorse the idea of perichoresis. I think if we understand the, the uh, autotheos of the spirit, then we can see uh, we do not need the idea of perichoresis actually. Because when we say about the spirit, it refers not only to the third hyp uh, hypothesis, the third person of the Trinity, it also refers to the whole ocean of God. And you can say in the same manner that when you say the word of God, it itself represents the whole God himself uh, in that word. So, you know, it captures it already in the total of the understanding. All right. Well, I think at this point, oh, sorry, Sam, go ahead. I don't have to. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, two things just to add um, to the question of Dr. Baylor that Calvin in Institute Group 2 and his commentary on, on the Synoptic Gospels, he talks about the Spirit sending Christ to the place of baptism, and the Spirit sends the Son at the baptism to the world, and the Spirit sends Christ to the wilderness to be tested. So there's a lot of um, Spirit sending the Son there. Uh, my question for Dr. Baylor is, um, so when you look at Group 2 of the Institute, it seems that it almost seems as though the spirit is playing a primary role in that he lays the ground for the sun to work. So in that sense, it doesn't really feel like a loving submission, but more the spirit is making it possible for the sun to do the work that is necessary for him. And so what do you think about that? And the second, so in, re in relation to that, um, in book two, Calvin suddenly becomes really quiet about the role of the spirit in Christ's eternal works when it comes to crucifixion. Do you know anything about Calvin's description of crucifixion where the three persons of the Trinity are at work, or would you say that the Son is primarily at work at the time of the crucifixion? All right, so two questions. Um, the In the crucifixion, is there more than the role of the son himself? In other words, is a spirit there too? And then um, in book two, it seems like the spirit might be kind of doing a lot. And then the question is, well, you know, what, what would you have to say about that understanding? Yeah, thank you. Great questions. Try to answer. Um, yeah, the first one. Yeah. I think uh, when we see the gospel itself and people try to develop spirit christology it is legitimate because again it is not only the son who did the work but he is doing the work in the power of the spirit so definitely we have to give more role to the spirit in the work of the son 
and his incarnation, and whether uh, the son, you know, do a loving submission in his work. I think Calvin, um, you know, understand the work of the son. Of course, it's centered in the cross. That's the, you know, uh, the emphasis, the main point in the Western theology, the work of the son at the cross. But in the Eastern theology, uh, the emphasis is placed on the incarnation of the son. And Calvin says that the whole life of the son of Christ is nothing but a perpetual cross. So he, dis he does not reduce the cross only at the point of the crucifixion, but the whole life of Christ. And you can say that it's a life of loving submission to the father. And then uh, the second question about what is the role of the spirit uh, regarding Christ's atoning work on the cross? I try to approach it uh, again from the idea of divine discourse. And again, this is not totally alien in Calvin's theology because word and spirit is God's essence and then the divine discourse is the reality of God. So I try to understand it as a divine conversation. There on the cross, the son cried out to the father, Eli Eli Lam, Lama Sabachthani, and also um, into your hand I commit my spirit. And it is as though there is no answer from the father, right? Whereas the father uh, you know, uh, spoke during the baptism and the Mount of Transfiguration, but not at the cross. So my answer is that even though there is no answer on the cross, God listened in his silence. The spirit is the one who listened. And the answer comes on the third day, the resurrection. It was, uh, I think, Jensen who said that the yeah, resurrection is the answer of the Father. Yeah. So that's the, in the divine uh, drama of redemption. Yeah, we can see how Jesus is the one who pray, uh, to speak to the Father. And it is the spirit who listens and the spirit who raised Christ from the dead. And it's the work of the Trinity to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very strong note on which to end. I'm very, very appreciative. Um, so again, our next series of presentations will be July 25. And come for Calvin's birthday next Tuesday, if you like. And in the meantime, please join me in thanking Dr. Santos.